Greetings, Pastor. My name is Tom Gilson, and you don't know me, but I was for eight and a half years a senior editor with the website The Stream, stream stream.org, commenting, writing over a thousand articles on faith and culture. I've written several books. I've been involved in the questions of faith and culture for years. I was a, before that time, a senior ministry strategist with Campus Crusade for Christ, now called Crew, with another ministry, uh, campus ministry called Ratio Christi, and with the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. I helped to found a an apologetics leadership group that involves some of the most famous and prominent writers on the questions of culture in the country. But my heart has turned, in fact, it for a long time it's been on the local church. For years, my very best friends, it seems, most of them, have been pastors. And uh, I've just loved many times inviting a pastor out to lunch, sitting across a table from him and just saying, tell me your story and listening. And my goodness, the stories that I have heard, the stories that you could tell me. As a ministry strategist, even though I was involved in parachurch organizations, I also read the Bible, and I also knew something about strategy, and it was very clear to me that the center, the heart of everything is the local church, and your role as the pastor, as the leader, is at the center of that. My heart is with you. You have a difficult, lonely job, perhaps the most difficult job in the world, I come to you with both hope and with a heavy heart because your job is getting much, much harder because of the way the world is changing. Maybe you have a sign or maybe you've been to churches where there's a sign at the exit of the church. I've seen this several churches that I've been to that says this, and, and it's a good one. It's a reminder to the people as they leave the worship time and the sign that i'm talking about is the one that says you are now entering the mission field well the way the world has changed it's time to turn that sign around for one thing because when we enter the church we are now entering the mission field we need to be evangelizing our own people discipling them in the real truths of the faith because people are so confused and so so filled with questions and so lost for answers even within the church but along with that we need to as i said flip the sign around but the part that people see as they leave the church needs to be rewritten because because now the truth is as you leave the church you are now entering the foreign mission field. The world has turned foreign. I remember when almost everyone said they believed in God. Now they might mean the man upstairs or something like that, something that really wasn't God. But they said that they believed in God and they had some conception in mind of what we Christians meant when we used the word God. They, there was some agreement that the Christian religion was good and, and healthy and helpful to society. And people would, you, you ask them if they go to church and they say, well, no, but I probably should. Those days are no more. Materialistic atheism reigns. By materialistic, I mean the belief that there is nothing to the world except for material things, the things that science can can study, things you can touch and feel and, and, so, and so on. There is no supernatural realm. That's the reigning viewpoint in the world today. But along, along with that, there, there are other competing viewpoints like the New Age viewpoint, which kind of, in some people's minds, coexists with that kind of atheism. It's very strange. But more than that, we have returned to polytheism. Polytheism? You mean, Tom, are you talking about like the gods of the Greeks and, and the Romans and the Norse? And, no, no this, this is a different kind. 
in, in the old days of the myths, there were a limited number of gods, and there was a hierarchy of gods. Zeus was in charge of the Greek gods. Today, we have many, many gods, but no one's in charge. It's one God per person. Perhaps you've heard the term expressive individualism. It was coined by, I think, Charles Taylor and popularized somewhat in books that I hope every pastor is familiar with, Strange New World by Carl Truman. And in more depth, he wrote another one called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And in it, he speaks of what perhaps you have already sensed, which is that every person is in charge of his or her own truth, in charge of his or her own world, in charge of his or her own reality, and no one is allowed to encroach upon it. No one can impinge upon it. No one can say it's right or wrong. They're the king, the god of their own universe, and no one has a say in it. They are in charge. As a side note, I wonder how many of them have realized how lonely they're making themselves because besides being the god of their own universe, each one of them is its only living inhabitant. There's maybe a chance for some evangelistic effect there, reaching out to that loneliness. But you dare not encroach upon this because they are in charge. And this is each person being the a god, small g, of their own world. This is a new kind of polytheism. The world has turned hostile to Christianity. This too is foreign. You can see it among the elites. You can see it in the, in the discussions about abortion or about sexuality. You can see it in the questions, why are you so bigoted? You, you know, even among within what is, should be the, the brotherhood, progressive Christianity. George Yancey, sociologist, did a study some five, maybe 10 years ago of the views that conservative and progressive Christians have towards each other. And conservatives tend to have an attitude of disagreement, the love, where progressives have an attitude of disagreement, but contempt towards those of us who hold to historic, orthodox, evangelical Christian belief. There's hostility toward us, and this too is foreign. It is practically as if we were on some hostile tribal island somewhere. And this is not the world. Well, it depends on when you went into ministry. If you're younger, if it's recent, this is perhaps what you thought you, what you were signing up for. If you're older, if you're my age in particular, you're saying, I didn't sign up for this. I wasn't planning on this, but the world has changed. Our ministry field has changed. The children in our church, the teens in our church are not what they once were. The church has to change. This is no longer negotiable. If you're going to have a ministry in this world, your church must change. Change? Here's where I can destroy my credibility with you. I can say, you know, change is difficult. No, change in the church is much more than difficult. It's, it's, it's far harder than that. It's very difficult. And you know that, to change a church, very, you're, really, you're really fighting against the law. You're fighting against tradition and elders and opinions and maybe your biggest givers uh, demands or whatever it might be, or, or your Sunday school teacher's insistence that they not be told what to teach. Who knows? Change is hard within the church, but you must, I'm sorry, Pastor, this is the heavy hearted part, you must prepare your people for life in a foreign mission land. Prepare them defensively how to answer the hard questions. When they get confronted with questions about sexuality, I had a conversation with a friend once who said that he's, he was in a corporate office building downtown in one of the big corporations near here, and he said that everyone in his, on his floor had an 
had, had a gay ally sticker on their office door. Everyone but him. He had done nothing, but he was a bad person. He said, what do I do? We talked about it some. I'm not going to tell you the advice or anything like that I gave. I don't even no, I don't even remember exactly how that came up. But I asked him, are you getting any help from your church on this? And he said, no. I'm not hearing from them. I'm not getting help there. Churches, if we can't help our people with crises of conscience like that, what are we there for? But... My gosh, the questions are hard. That was not an easy question. Questions of sexuality, of gender. Do I comply when my boss says I should be uh, or, or must use preferred pronouns? Um, questions about, quote, compassion when they tell us, you, you Christians just don't care because you don't care in the way that we think you should. You don't, you don't care about gays. You don't care about women or you don't care about the poor because of the way you vote, whatever it might be. Questions about expressive individualism, people's godhood in the world, as, and, and, and their insistence that they have their own truth and that we can't say anything about their truth and they, won't have to li- they don't have to listen to our truth. Um, by the way, don't ever teach that Christians hold the truth. The truth holds us. If, If we teach that we hold the truth, they're going to say, oh, well, you're holding your own truth. No, the truth is bigger, and it holds us. The truth is way bigger than us. There are questions about science and faith. Are Christians anti-science? There's a whole lot more. We need to prepare our people defensively to answer. There are a hundred hard questions out there that people are being faced with all the time. And we need to prepare them, not just defensively, but but to be grounded. I mean, the first step in preparing people in what I would call that defensive uh, position is to center in who God is. His sovereignty, his goodness, both his mercy and his holiness. That God's goodness doesn't just mean that he's nice to people and he won't mess with our preferences and that we're just fine with who we are and the way we want to live, but that his goodness comes as as an expression of his holiness. And God's goodness is good for us. This isn't just God's whim that we have to subject ourselves to. No, it's an expression of his character. And when he designed us, when he created us, His character was part of that design. So doing things the way God instructs us to do them is doing them according to his design. So, for example, his laws, his rules, his instructions on sex and marriage are good. A solid, stable marriage is good for the community. It builds the community. It's even better for the children. Can you imagine walking up to a 14-year-old and saying, were you raised in a in a stable home where your parents were in love with each other and were and loved their children and and if they say yes you you follow that up would you say well are you glad for that and they're going to say yes and if they say no my parents are fighting all the time or they divorced five years ago and you say do you wish they'd stayed together and had been a happy loving home they're going to say yeah i wish it had been You don't need big sociological studies on this, but if you did, you could go to Professor Brad Wilcox out of the University of Virginia, who's done a lot on it, and he's shown how healthy it is for people to have stable marriages. It's good for the couple. The happiest wives in the country are, believe it or not, actual studies, are wives in conservative, committed Christian marriages. And the same for husbands. God's design is good, and it's good if, if we have a strong marriage culture in the country to, to help support that. So this is what we need to teach our people, but we need to teach them, above all else, that there is one God, that he is sovereign, that He is, and that we are subject to him as his creatures, and that it's 
good that we are. I am so thankful that the one God is a good God. But if we could do anything to correct the condition of our churches and our culture within our churches, it would be a a great reset on our view of God, that he is God. But we have to answer the questions too. My, the problem with my friend who didn't get that hard crisis of conscience question answered in his church. And this is happening all over the place. So how do you do this? Uh, we're talking about change in the church. We're talking about something that's difficult. How do you fit these hard cultural questions into your Sunday morning teaching, for example? Well, if your preferred approach is expository teaching, I'm not going to recommend you try it very much at least, you might find times as you're going through scripture when you run into an issue, like talking about marriage, for example, in in Ephesians maybe, where you're going to, you're going to have the opportunity to say, now here's where people in our culture are going to have a problem with this. And you can dwell on it for a while and identify the problem, bring it out in the open and give an answer. That would be fitting within your expository teaching. Otherwise, I wouldn't recommend you you give up what you're doing as an expository preacher. Uh, you might do something like a Sunday school class and find a good teacher or, or someone um, doing a special curriculum or a seminar. A church my daughter attended had expository teaching in the morning and the pastors did a podcast that was on cultural issues. So, uh, or you could leave good books and, or uh, feature good books and, you know, podcasts or whatever in your hallways, your websites, your church bulletins. Now, if you teach topically, then you can do it. And I've heard teachers and preachers do series on apologetics. I've heard them do well. I've heard them do poorly. Uh, the last one. Uh, that I heard from an apologetics uh, series, I, I'm i sorry, there were several cringe moments. Do study, do make sure you know what you're talking about, because I wasn't the only one cringing there when he said, for example, that we know that the New Testament is reliable because we have over 5,000 Hebrew and Aramaic uh, manuscripts of it after the fact. I think in that congregation there were several people who knew that he didn't mean Hebrew and Aramaic. He was Greek and Latin would have been the better answer. But yeah, uh, go for it. Teach on these questions if you're a topical teacher. Uh, Stay centered though on the reality of God and the goodness of the gospel. Stay centered on that. But again, we're talking about change. We're talking about the church's position in the hostile foreign culture. We're talking about something unprecedented in history where the church has, without picking up and moving, without any passports or language study, has found itself replanted from a home environment to a foreign environment. This has never happened before. We are in really pioneering territory here. We are doing something new. We are doing something difficult. I, as an apologist, know some things that can help. Apologists, and I mean even the casual person who likes reading apologetics books in your church, can undoubtedly help. But I, as an apologist, though I've been doing it professionally for a long time, cannot pretend to have the explanation or the answers for you on how you're going to do this in your church. I think it's going to take pastors working together to figure this out, asking each other questions, um, solving problems together. I think it's going to take something like community. 
That's actually a biblical word. Community between pastors, maybe within your denomination, maybe your local ministerial group, whatever. It's going to take pastors saying, we need to work this problem together. We need to solve together, not just the, the questions about you know, how do you answer X question about X challenge? But how do I accomplish change within my church? How do I preach differently? How do I set up a different structure? Do I set up a different structure? How do I deal with my, uh, my biggest donor who's not happy with me even talking about these things in church? These are questions not for apologists, but for you. We are experts in a little. You are experts in what, in the broad scope of ministry. But you can share your expertise with each other. I dreamed for over 10 years, and I've made several false starts at this, mostly because I was working at least two other jobs most of the time. But I retired earlier this summer, and my dream, I was ready for it, I wanted to just gather pastors and be a person. I've, I've been able to help people network, and I just wanted to say, let's get together and do this. And I'll be a resource, and I'll be a person to help organize it, but it's not my job to pretend I know your answers. I know some, but you know yours, and you can share them with each other. I've so much wanted to do that and just help. I mean... My favorite thing in the world is to hear a pastor say, thank you, God. Thank you, Tom. That was helpful. Um, I thought that this was when I was going to get to do that. Um, and, and it was going to be after a trip to Germany to see my daughter and grandkids and, and son-in-law there. Um, they're on station there for a while with the military and um, had a little health problems there, came home, got it checked out, and got an incredible surprise diagnosis of stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, I'm not expecting to be able to do what I thought I could do. I, I wouldn't mind... God willing and giving me time, I wouldn't mind pulling together a Zoom call and and just gathering with some of you for one or two times at least as God allows. Maybe more. Maybe God will heal. Uh, we'll put notes on this in the program notes on how we might initiate that. I wouldn't mind doing that at all because I'd love to have those conversations and, and just see if there's a way to do something. Or if you're in the Dayton, Ohio area, we'll, we'll provide a way for contact. Um, that's where I live. I don't mean to be melodramatic, but my dying wish would be that pastors would face the challenge and I recognize how hard it is, but we have to face it because the world has changed. Face the challenge, work it together. Work it together, solve it together as much as it can be and make your church ready for the day in which we live to stand strong and to have a strong witness for Christ and make the difference in this world for the glory of Jesus Christ and the glory of God. That the knowledge of the glory of the Lord would fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14